our next conversation is uh, is called Transform the Economy with the Internet of Things. Um, it, it's a it's a terrific conversation, and it's a really um, for me such an honor um, to introduce Karen Cornblue, uh, who I never had the pleasure of working with at New America. I I I came just as she had left, um, and I remember hearing that she, she had left to go work for this um, senator uh, from Illinois, uh, Barack Obama. She went on to be his, she was his policy director, um, and uh, went on to write the platform for the Democratic Party. Um, most recently, she was the U.S. Ambassador to the OECD, and now she is Executive Vice President at uh, uh, Nielsen. I'm going to let her introduce the rest of the panel, but I also want to give a quick shout out to my colleague. Michael Lind, one of the founders of New America. Um, this is his idea. Um, you should read it in the, um, in, in the materials you have and look forward to reading the fullness of it when it comes out a little bit later this summer. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, hello, thank you, and welcome uh, to the panel. It's called um, Transform the Economy with the Internet of Things, and it's going to pick up on one of the points that Secretary Clinton was just discussing, which is, how do we spur the economy and create jobs? Um, but I, I want to put it in context. Um, there are a lot of people who don't agree that we can grow the economy and create jobs. And if you look at um, some of the discussion that's going on about Thomas Piketty's new book on inequality, you'll see that there's this fatalism. Um, he, t he says, actually, that uh, the growth rate worldwide will be stuck at 1 to 1.5 percent, no matter what economic policy uh, we use. This is a fatalism that's, that's actually quite common. We've given up in a lot of ways from thinking that there's anything we can do about the real economy, that there's anything we can do about growth, that there's anything we can do about jobs. His solution is radical, a global wealth tax, but this prescription, uh, this diagnosis really isn't. There's this fatalism that the age of invention is behind us, it's over, and a sense that there's nothing that policy can do. And that fatalism, I think, flies in the face of the history of the country, as the Secretary was discussing. If you think about uh, what we did to spur canals and highways, and then most recently under President Clinton, the internet, you'll see that there are things that policy can do, that government can do, that business can do to, uh, to spur innovation. So this panel, I think, will try to inject a bit of hope and, and hopefully realism into the debate about all that. And I just want to remind you that according to McKinsey, the internet has already generated as much growth over the past 15 years as the Industrial Revolution generated in 50 years. So uh, we've already seen that the age of, of, of uh, invention and innovation is with us in the internet. Now we're going to talk about what's next. And uh, I think we couldn't have a better panel. It's really exciting. I'm very interested to hear what they all have to say, having read their work. I'll start with Suzanne Berger. She is professor of political science at MIT, uh, recently co-chaired the MIT Production and the Innovation Economy Project. In September, she published Making in America. Uh, she created the MIT International Science and Technology Initiatives and discusses the MIT France program. Katie George, uh, who's right here, is the author of Next Shoring, a CEO's Guide. She serves as global co-leader of McKinsey's Manufacturing Group, and she's a leader within the pharmaceutical and medical products practice. She also directs the New Jersey office and has a PhD in business economics from Harvard. Marco. Um, Annunziato, sitting right next to her, is GE's chief economist. He's executive director of Global Market Insight at GE. He's the author of The Economics of the Financial Crisis and a two times winner of the Society of Business Economists' Best Paper in Business Economics. Marco holds a PhD in economics from Princeton. And Michael Lind uh, is co founder of the New America Foundation, uh, whose hospitality you're enjoying right now. And with Ted Halstead, he wrote The Radical Center, which is New America's manifesto. He's currently policy director of the Economic Growth Program, and he's been an editor or staff writer for The New Yorker, Harper's, The New Republic, and The National Interest. I bet no one else can say that. Uh, Lynn is a columnist for Salon. He writes frequently for The New York Times. He's the author of numerous books, and his most recent one is called Land of Promise in Economic History of the United States. So this is going to be a fabulous, fabulous discussion that will blow your minds away. So I'm going to start. Uh, with a question for Katie, uh, just to set the stage for us about what technology we're talking about. Uh, what is the Internet of Things? What is the industrial Internet? What, what exactly are we going to be discussing? And just get, get our, our lay people's heads around all this. Perfect. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, the Internet of Things is transforming the way manufacturing works um, and, in fact, the way supply chains work uh, across all different kinds of industries. 
Um, when we think about the Internet of Things, we think about six different related elements. So the first to think about are smart machines. So think about every machine in the world having sensors such that they can transmit real-time data about their performance. The second is smart products. So think about from the time a product is developed, uh, having a product have a, a digital DNA, if you will, that follows that product from uh, digital product development through sourcing, through manufacturing, into the way it's distributed, and into post-sale service. So you can actually trace if a product is working or not working, trace that all the way back to some of its basic characteristics in product development. You can trace it back to exactly where a certain part was made around the world and how it was made. You can trace it back to where it was assembled, to what the conditions were uh, in which uh, the supply chain operated and that it was transported and stored uh, in, in the supply chain. So smart products, smart machines. The third element is the digital threat. So all of the technology kind of infrastructure and standards that connect all of that together and allow that data to be available and connected. Uh, the fourth element is advanced analytics. So when you have all of this data, how do you actually use it to improve decision making? And so there will be and already is just a burgeoning field around how to use this data to make better decisions real time. Fifth area that we point to is cybersecurity. So obviously all of this works only if companies and uh, supply chains and consumers feel protected uh, in terms of how this data is leveraged. And then finally, you see that all of this interconnection will create totally new business models in manufacturing and supply chain, very similar to what we've seen in the com consumer world. So new digital marketplaces, if you will. Think about in the consumer world, we've connected a billion consumers together. And we all live every day what the impact of that is in terms of how we connect with each other around the world, how we collaborate and share ideas, how we collaborate to create momentum to get something new done, um, and also how we buy and sell things. Totally transformed. Now we're not talking about con connecting a billion consumers. We're actually talking about connecting 50 billion machines. And it will have the same kind of impact on business models, digital marketplaces, new app economies, et cetera, that you saw in the consumer economy. That's great. Thank you so much for explaining that. And Margo, I want to turn to you and ask you about your views. And I, I was just remembering, as Katie was talking, really early in my career, I did some consulting to GE. And it was in the pre-internet days, because I'm really, really old. And <laughs> GE had electronic uh, connections with its vendors. And it was just starting to think about the implications of that. So you weren't just sending an order to your vendor, but now you could have a real relationship back and forth with a vendor could start to help you design your product. And that kind of thinking eventually really transformed business, led to all kinds of productivity as the internet spread. What, what kinds of implications can we see for businesses from what Katie's talking about? Huge implications. And actually, let me start picking up on something you just said, which is uh, electronic communications have been around for some time, and so have electronic sensors. So sometimes when people hear about the industrial internet, the reaction is skeptical, is to say, well, you're talking about electronic sensors, computers, these have been around for a long time. Why do you think this is changing now? What makes it different? And what's happening now over the last few years is a massive and rapid decline in the cost of sensors, but also in the cost of storing and processing data thanks to cloud computing. And this is really accelerating things. And from a business perspective, you realize that what is happening is, first of all, you are unleashing the power of an amount of information that we never had access to before we never even thought we could access before. So for business leaders, there is also the challenge of getting their heads around the fact that they now operate in an environment where the range of possibilities is expanding suddenly. Then the challenge is to realize that all these innovations are translating greater efficiency and speed. So Katie was pointing out the sensors and the enormous amounts of data they're generating and how smart analytics then convert this into insights. But what it boils down to is greater efficiency. So you look at the aviation sector, this means, for example, less fuel consumption because you understand the engine better, you could have operated better. 
it means fewer flight delays and cancellations because all of a sudden you can switch to preventive maintenance. So once you understand the machine so much better and the machine is smart enough to communicate with you, you can go and fix it just before it breaks down rather than waiting for the machine to break and then getting yourself stuck on the tarmac because there is a technical problem with the, with the aircraft. It also means uh, enormous increases in efficiency and steps towards greater sustainability, by the way. We think about uh, energy, and we've talked a lot yesterday about uh, gas, but renewable energy remains important. And if you look at what happens in wind farms, you now have wind farms where the different turbines can talk to each other. And depending on how the wind switches, the turbines will, in a coordinated way, adjust the pitch of their blades to operate more efficiently. You're talking about better health outcomes. We had an excellent presentation on the health sector yesterday, and it's entirely driven by the cost pressures. And here you have everything from greater efficiency in the operation of uh, hospitals uh, to the ability for surgeons uh, and nurses and doctors uh, to collaborate simultaneously on the same set of tests once, once a patient comes in in the cloud, which gives you greater speed and better health outcomes. Uh, but what this is telling you is, uh, as a company, you're moving to selling outcomes and services rather than just selling products. And that is the first a huge implication in terms of business models. The second implication is uh, how you use uh, talent across the world. Uh, look at the point of view of our company. GE has always done a lot of innovation. We've historically done it in-house. Then in the digital age, you realize that innovation moves faster if you can open it up, if you can access a much broader pool of talent. So we started in a targeted way. We had an open competition where we said, uh, can anybody come up with an idea for a design for a better jet engine bracket? Small thing which fixes the engine to the airplane. And we said, we want uh, a lighter design and we want it 3D printed. We had lots of great designs coming in, the three best designs from people with no experience in aviation, the top winning design, a young Indonesian engineer, no experience in aviation, a design that reduces the weight by 80%. Our engineers looked at it and first said, it's not possible, it cannot be. Then they looked closer, and yes it is, and we're adopting it. But you start doing it on a small scale like this, you realize that the potential is such that uh, there will be no other way. This has to be exploited. But it's a huge challenge if you really want to have a broader use of this. Uh, what do you do in terms of uh, incentives? A cash price is not going to be enough if you really want to open it up. What do you do in terms of safeguarding intellectual property? So huge challenges ahead from this, from this perspective. And uh, I would say that from, uh, from this perspective, the third uh, big challenge you have for business is the shifting nature of competition. Because what this boils down to is uh, the meshing of the digital world and the physical world. So all of a sudden, uh, your range of uh, competitors shifts because companies who were not in your space before can enter into the services, into the digital services, especially as you have other techniques like advanced manufacturing, breaking down barriers. So changing the nature of economies of scale, making it possible to lower entry costs in different parts of your business. So the change in the competitive landscape, how you use global talent through crowdsourcing, and really how you switch towards selling services and outcomes are to me the three biggest challenges for businesses. That's fabulous, thank you. And we'll return to a lot, all of those issues. I wanted to turn to Suzanne. The secretary uh, used the word ecosystem uh, and she was talking about Silicon Valley and that you need to have uh, a lot more than just an idea uh, to deploy new technology and to nurture it and to lead to jobs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I, I think that uh, we're at the moment of tremendous new opportunities in the United States to really be able to bring our great innovation to market in a way that would really create great new value, uh, both uh, value in the form of new jobs and value in the form of new profits for companies and new companies. Uh, but the question is, what are the obstacles that up to now have really blocked us from being able to transform innovation into products that actually reach the market in a way that creates value in American society. And I think that uh, the new opportunities have to do not only with these new technologies that we see, but with the fact that there's a lot more realism in companies 
about the values of locating uh, production and innovation in the United States. We've gone through a period in which uh, uh, we've uh, seen a lot of outsourcing of jobs. We've seen uh, that people really did not entirely understand the value of co-locating production and innovation. And I think there's a lot more realism today, as well as an environment with lower energy costs that makes it uh, possible for us to imagine uh, locating more production in, in proximity to innovation. And that's, in a way, the real promise of these new, uh, of these new technologies, that they will allow us to move uh, more rapidly from laboratory uh, into the market, and that they'll reduce what one of my colleagues at MIT calls the tyranny of bulk. That is, the need to produce in gigantic factories uh, and, and to have gigantic workforces in order to move products into mass markets. And I think that these new technologies, together with, uh, uh, together with the innovation that we can see across the country, really open up great new opportunities. But that we have to understand that technology is not a silver bullet. There are really uh, huge holes that have opened in our industrial ecosystem. And if we can't fix them, we're not going to be able to bring the benefit of these new technologies uh, to, to, to land within our own economy in the form of good new jobs or good new companies. What, what, what do I mean by these holes in the ecosystem? Well, you could think of them as market failures. That is, as, as uh, difficulties that we have as a society in moving from innovation actually to, uh, to the market. So uh, something like scaling up a great new idea. When we in our MIT uh, research project looked at startups that grow out of MIT, these companies do great for about five to seven years because they have lots of venture capital funding. But when it comes to actually building a factory after the, the startup is five to seven years old, these companies just uh, don't find capital in American capital markets. We saw uh, small scale and medium scale manufacturers in Ohio, in Arizona. These are companies that have great ideas moving up from the shop floor. They don't have local bankers any longer. So these ideas move to market only slowly, slowly, slowly as these uh, entrepreneurs drip in something from last year's retained capital. We see the same issue about training. These are companies that are now much smaller. Apprenticeships have become rare in the United States. And the only way that we can fix these holes, these, fix the ecosystem, is by some kind of private, public coordination and convening that can uh, both address the issue of scale up, the issue of training, the issue of uh, connecting suppliers within the United States uh, uh, to, uh, to the centers of innovation and creation. And I think these are the issues we're going to need to address in order to be able to get the value out of these great new technologies. So Michael, is this, uh, what do you say to the skeptics who say um, we've become a service economy, uh, manufacturing is moving abroad, we're, you know, we're the city of London, you know, and poverty surrounding us, and that the internet really is an invention that, uh, that's very exciting at all. It's just about cute videos of cats. You know, how would you, how would you put this, this, uh, this discussion that we're having in some historical context and give us a feeling that, that maybe something's going on here? Well, the quick answers, which I'll explain, are first uh, that the real productivity gains come from uh, innovation based on technology, not from the initial technology itself. And the second answer about the debate is the future of the economy, manufacturing, or services. The answer is yes, because of the increasing blurring uh, of, of these uh, two separate categories. Uh, to explain the first uh, point, economic historians like to distinguish invention from innovation, which are sometimes used as synonyms. Invention is the technology, it's the gizmo. Innovation is what you do with it. And there's usually a time lag between invention and innovation when the real productivity gains materialize. And, and this is all very abstract, so I'll illustrate this with the internal combustion engine. You know, this is invented in the 1860s, 1870s. Put it on a bicycle frame and you have an automobile. Uh, it took some time for the automobility to move into the innovation phase 
when it really began to transform not just the economy and business models, but, but literally the landscape. Uh, and in order to reap the real productivity gains from an invention, you need an appropriate infrastructure, and in this case, a good road system, traffic lights, gas stations, you know, all, all of this. But then uh, you get both the transformation of pre-existing industries, for example, agricultures, you know, by, by uh, tractors and, and uh, powered combines, uh, uh, corporations uh, switching to trucking so they could become national rather than just regional corporations. You also get entirely new businesses, uh, like when I finally, fondly recall from my youth, the drive-in movie theater, I think in 1900, if one were predicting the impact of the automobile on society, nobody would have envisioned drive-in restaurants and drive-in movie theaters. And this is where entrepreneurialism comes in, because at the invention phase of a technology, like the sensors, which are the basis of the Internet of Things, uh, R&D is very important. Uh, uh, venture capital, government R&D, uh, corporate R&D. It's figuring out things to do with the technology uh, to satisfy needs that nobody actually knew they, they had. Uh, that's the innovation phase. And, and just to answer the second uh, uh, question, uh, servitization is a really, really ugly portmanteau word uh, for a very important process, which is uh, the increasing breaking down of the distinctions between manufacturing and services. In the old days, you manufactured a product and you sold it, and that was the end of it. And then if it broke down, somebody would repair it. Uh, increasingly, you have uh, companies involved in the entire lifestyle uh, of, the, of the product. As was mentioned earlier, they can be involved in the conception and gestation too with uh, mass customization. So it's not just, it's conception to grave. It's not even uh, cradle to grave anymore. Uh, and, and as some of my colleagues has pointed out, this really is altering the very nature of business models because you have to ask yourself, are you a service and repair company that has a manufacturing line or, or are you a manufacturing company that, that has a service business? So let's go back to Marco to pick up on that and, and maybe you can also talk about what you call the power of 1%. You know, is this gonna lead to a lot of job growth? Definitely. So I'm picking up with what Michael was saying. Uh, more and more companies will see themselves as really selling solutions, outcomes, uh, trying to figure out what problems need to be solved and how to solve them through the right combination of uh, products and the associated services. Uh, also, and also the point that Suzanne made on ecosystems is uh, crucial because uh, we can't do it all by ourselves. No single company can. So the solution has to be figured out also by looking not just that what the competition is doing, as I mentioned earlier, but who do you partner with in, all, in order to do this uh, most uh, efficiently. And uh, keeping in mind that uh, the, uh, the potential in terms of uh, not just business results, but also the whole economic impact. So how much can we get from this in terms of uh, productivity, GDP, so higher incomes, jobs being created, is enormous. And Michael, you made a very important point, which reminds us that uh, these innovations uh, processes play out over a long horizon. The Industrial Revolution played out over 150 years. And people have the tendency today to look at the innovation coming from the digital age and uh, brush them off. As you said, it's just cute videos of cats. It's uh, silly games, social media, nothing else. Uh, unemployment is still high. What are you guys talking about? We have to keep in mind it takes time for the process to feed through. And so the power of 1% is something that we have done in our studies to try to fix ideas, put some numbers on this. And, uh, asking the question, how much can we get from this in terms of dollars? And the way we've done it is, uh, first of all, to start and going uh, to our scientists, our engineers, our customers in the various sectors uh, and see how much can you get from these innovations uh, in terms of higher, and higher efficiency. And across the board, you come to the conclusion that you can get at least 1%, probably a lot more, but at least 1%. And then the temptation, of course, is to say, well, 1%, it's, it's incremental. You're talking about a revolution. What is 1%? But then you think about 1% greater efficiency being applied over huge installed bases of uh, engines, power plants, uh, hospitals. The figures add up very, very quickly to very large numbers, which is how we came in our regional study to the impact on productivity and GDP globally to about 15 trillion over the next uh, over the next 20 years. It means over the next 20 years, you add to the global economy the size of the US economy, 
to date. So this is huge. That's I, really. I can just build on that. We, uh, McKinsey Global Institute did uh, a study of 12 different disruptive technologies to understand what the impact of them could be. And the Internet of Things, uh, we actually looked at what were the total operating costs of all of the different uh, kind of sectors that would be impacted by the kinds of technologies we're talking about. And it's $36 trillion a year globally. So even a small improvement uh, makes a huge difference, and that's an annual figure. And, and Katie, you've talked about some of the decisions that companies need mm -hmm. to make about where to locate as a result yep. of all this. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, in another study, we looked at uh, how companies were deciding where to manufacture and how macroeconomic trends uh, are impacting that and how that will play out over time. Um, and the technologies we're talking about impact that in a couple of really important ways. Um, first of all, we looked at all of the different sectors of the economy uh, of the manufacturing economy, and only a small percentage, only about 15%, are really driven by labor cost. So this whole question of labor cost arbitrage, uh, uh, offshoring jobs uh, to China, could we reshore jobs from China because their wage rates are going up, that actually only impacts a very sh small portion of our total manufacturing economy. What's far more important to uh, the, uh, our manufacturing sectors are, first of all, uh, demand patterns and the proximity to demand. So Secretary Clinton talked about the fact that uh, in order to really jumpstart or accelerate the U.S. manufacturing economy, we need to see increased consumption, and that's exactly right. If you look at what the most important uh, elements of job loss have been in manufacturing, um, a lot of it is to do with the fact that we were growing productivity faster than we were growing demand. And that became quite acute through the recession. If you look at where we grew manufacturing jobs since the recovery, you actually see it in automotive and related sectors that are really driven by increased US demand. Um, and what's happening in demand in addition to uh, driving kind of localized production is actually an increase in the demand for variety. And so the kind of mass customization that uh, digital manufacturing capabilities, digital supply chain uh, actually enables, will put even more premium on placing manufacturing or at least some portion of the value chain near demand and takes away the value of, uh, in some cases, the value of huge economies of scale so that you can actually have much more responsive uh, and short supply chains to meet local and very uh, highly variable customized demand. Um, the other piece, though, that we saw was that increasingly where companies manufacture is uh, based on where they find healthy ecosystems of process innovation. And so uh, digital technology allows you to activate capacity anywhere around the world, just as well as walking down you know, from headquarters to the plant shore and into the, plants, the plant floor in your, in your, you know, near your headquarters. So in some sense, it allows you to operate uh, and plan and manage capacity globally. Uh, but where companies will locate is where they can find the labor force and the whole supply base that enables them to be on the cutting edge and to continue to uh, not just invent, but innovate with new technologies. And that's where the importance for the US in creating these ecosystems is so high. So is there hope that this will lead to jobs, Suzanne? What do you think? Yes. I mean, I, I, I think that um, uh, the New America Foundation, as I've learned over these two days, is about ideas and changing ideas and, and new big ideas. And I think one big idea that we really need to focus on is that we have somehow uh, imagined that uh, production and, uh, and manufacturing and services are two different economies and that we're moving out of production into services. And I think what you're hearing here in this panel is that almost all great new products and almost all great new companies today are making bundles that are in some way combinations of both uh, manufactured or produced goods, material uh, goods, and, uh, and services. So I would call uh, a manufactured good something that if you drop it on your foot, <laughs> you know that it's been manufactured. And um, uh, as we uh, looked across the economy, we saw it's not only Apple that's making 
iPods and iPhones and iPads that are beautiful physical objects that people want to hold. And if they drop them on their foot, you'd know it was manufactured. Uh, but that, that uh, it's valuable because it combines services. It's not only Apple that's doing this kind of combination. It's uh, a, a manufacturer in, in Ohio that's making half sleeves that repair oil pipes. If you have a leaky oil pipe uh, in an offshore or an onshore uh, oil installation, you can't weld it because the pipe would blow up. And so this company makes the half sleeves that bites into the pipe and repairs the leak. Uh, this company sees itself as a manufacturing company, but the fact is they send technicians out with the half sleeves, and their technicians stand on the oil platforms and coach the divers who are positioning the half sleeve. Mm -hmm. So what is this company? Well, it's a kind of mix of a service together with a product. And I think that's where the new jobs in our economy are going to come from, from these bundles of services and manufactured goods. They're going to take new skills. Uh, they're going to require a kind of proximity between innovators and producers. And I think the question for us in terms of policy is, how do we generate these skills and how do we actually change capital markets so we can bring these actually to scale? I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, policy because I, wa I want to get to policy. And I just, uh, I'm, we're going to go through one more round and talk about policy and then we're going to open up the floor. So if you have any questions, please start thinking about them. But, but uh, just, actually, Michael wanted to jump in. Michael, go, do you want to go ahead. So I was just going to jump in very quickly on the issue of skills, because to create jobs, something which is becoming more and more essential is doing a better job at aligning the supply of skills to the demand. And part of it, I think, is to treat the basic scientific literacy as the new literacy. So it's becoming a more technologically advanced world. We don't all need to be scientists and data, and data scientists and engineers, but uh, the level of STEM education needs to rise. The deterioration in the education system over the last two decades is part of the problem. But the second is a closer dialogue between uh, education system and industry. And Secretary mm. Clinton mentioned community colleges. We do a lot of, of work with those because we don't all need to be high-flying college graduates. There are a lot of very useful, very qualified, very high-paying technical jobs that need to be filled. So filling this gap, aligning supply and demand of skills is going to be crucial. I, I just want to make one point, uh, uh, focusing on a particular industry that we don't think of. Uh, as a manufacturing industry, and that's medicine. Uh, when we discuss medicine in the United States, it tends to be in terms of budgetary costs of Medicare or Medicaid or health insurance. Uh, but actually, medicine is a perfect example of servitization of this fusion between manufacturing and services. If you're having customized physical implants that are monitoring your health and communicating with a hospital or a, a, a corporation or a, some sort of diagnostic system, uh, you're seeing that merger of manufacturing, and in this case, a very customized, specialized, uh, personalized uh, manufacturing. And I think we should embrace medicine. Uh, not when You don't want to have cost overruns, but as societies get richer, just as individuals, uh, and other costs fall thanks to productivity, people spend more on health. And uh, medicine actually is, is a potential leading sector of advanced industrial economies, and it provides everything from unskilled jobs for nursing aides uh, to, to highly skilled jobs, but also it will increasingly rely on uh, manufacturing, both as inputs and things that medical providers do themselves. So what, what, what are some of the policy issues that we need to confront? How can we not only spur uh, this revolution, but also see that uh, some of the growth is located in the US and that people can get these jobs? And I just keep thinking of those huge buildings on the mall many of which were built in response to the industrial age that you talked about, Michael, and so we had big industry uh, and we put in place you know, these big agencies that were going to regulate them top down. Now that we're talking about this decentralized, but maybe it's bundled, maybe it's mass customization, does it call for a different kind of policy solution? Katie, do you have any thoughts? Um, well, I think the, the two things that uh, uh, I see from working in the manufacturing sector that are most important have been mentioned here already. And one is um, education and skills and creating that match. Uh, and the second is ensuring that small companies, uh, so the, the supply base, the moms and pops and the ones slightly more sophisticated, are able to keep up and uh, able to adopt 
new technologies as well as to contribute their ideas and innovations into the broader economy. I would mention just a couple more. One is infrastructure, both the physical infrastructure and also the data digital infrastructure. It's crucial. And the second one is cybersecurity, because yeah. all of this is also opening up new areas of vulnerability from an industrial sector, critical infrastructure. So both of these issues are top of mind. I'd like to come back to the education point, because I think that what we've seen in this country uh, is a shift from a world, uh, a corporate world 30 years ago, where big companies provided many apprenticeships. And then people who were trained in those uh, apprenticeships uh, sort of filtered out into the economy, and they were the base of our skilled uh, workforce. And what's happened is that as companies have become smaller, leaner, more focused on core competence, you've seen a disappearance of these training opportunities. Take, for example, uh, Rochester, New York, uh, where uh, Kodak used to employ 60,000 people and had hundreds of apprenticeships and funded uh, uh, the community college optics program. Well, Kodak now has, what, about 5,000 employees, and their apprenticeships are no more. But there are a lot of small, high-tech optics firms that have grown up in Rochester, New York. Each one of these companies, many of these companies are world leaders in small niches. But each of these companies is too small to be able on its own to support training, the community college program. And the question is, how do you pull together? How do you coordinate and convene these small, uh, these small enterprises, uh, these niche uh, firms, in order to create links with a community college, in order to have a common curriculum? And I think across the economy, what we're seeing is smaller firms and the need for the, the federal, state, and regional authorities to play some of this convening and coordinating role. That's what we need to use policy incentives for. Could we do, I mean, are we going to do that, Michael? I mean, should we start in an industry like health, where the government already has such a big footprint? Well, I think if we're talking about a world in which millions of billions of uh, uh, machines and even bodies are communicating with each other, this will require standards and regulations of, at some point. Uh, for cybersecurity reasons, for safety, for health, uh, and so on. I think the danger is uh, if you do it prematurely, you get regulatory lock-in with inferior technologies before better ones have developed. So I'm not really sure what the answer is. And, and of course, industry to industry, it varies. Uh, although to some degree, there will be uh, multi-industry standards because of the way the devices communicate. I, th I think in the United States, we can take advantage of our federal system, at least in the early stages of this, and allow cities and states to uh, explore things. And you mentioned the buildings on the mall. That, that's essentially what happened uh, in earlier phases of, of uh, industry and, and technological progress. That is, the best practices of the states were sometimes uh, adopted somewhat belatedly and made into federal standards. So I'd, I'd like to open up the floor. We're obviously, uh, we have a big idea in gestation here. Um, it seems like we need to put some uh, more detail into the policy uh, framework. So uh, anyone have any thoughts, any questions, any ideas? <coughs> There's somebody in the back there. Your mic isn't working. Nope. It's flashing green. I think I can, yeah. My name is Rebecca McKinnon. I'm uh, at the New America Foundation. I have a predictable question. Um, if cybersecurity was mentioned uh, at the end of, of the panel. Uh, what about surveillance? How do we ensure, yeah, I mean, the, the economic value of the Internet of Things seems quite clear. How do we hold government and companies accountable to the public interest, not only economically and in terms of public security, but to the values of democracy and prevent the big brother state from really uh, moving to the next level. Thanks for asking that. It is, it, you know, it's interesting. There was just this study that I'm going to talk for a second, give people time to think. Um, there was just this study that came out of the White House on big data, and it was just really interesting to see how it read because it said, you know, big data is good for this, and it's good for this, and it's good for this, and then you knew it was coming. But, and all the policy prescriptions were 
um, you know, and, and they had said this was gonna, what the report was going to be about. The, the, all the policy prescriptions had to do with the potential harm and danger uh, from big data, and a lot of those concern privacy. And privacy is obviously a critically important uh, issue, and it's so great that Rebecca asked about it. And I'm glad that we, we had at least the opportunity to talk about the upside at greater length um, <laughs> than usually happens here. But what, what do you all have to say about surveillance? I would say that part of the solution to me will come from the market incentives themselves, because what you're seeing with the industrial internet is uh, the harvesting of data on industrial machinery, and here the companies themselves have a huge incentive to make sure that data is kept sufficiently private, it's not misused, and it's not leaked. So there is an enormous amount of pressure, and in fact, making sure that the safeguards are put in place is a clear enabling condition which, unless it happens, the industrial internet will not spread. So I would bet on the market forces on this one, but I'm sure some of the other panelists have implementing ideas? I would bet on the law. I, th I think that we will use the law to have uh, some kind of trade-off based on a consensus, not everyone will agree, between privacy uh, and, and uh, accessibility uh, so that, for example, it will be easy for your doctor to monitor the implant in you, but it will be very hard and illegal for the communications company to then sell that uh, uh, data or, you know, for maybe the government to track exactly where you are at any moment. Uh, you know, no law is perfect. It can be abused by corporations and governments, but that's true with standards in general. So you, you almost see that as an enabling policy framework that would be necessary for the outgrowth of this technology um, would be that, that, that at least people have some protect, some assurances that there are protections of their privacy. Well, I think that, that will yeah. certainly be part of the regulatory framework. Anyone else? Lenny. No. I think we need the Internet of Things right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the cloud. No. Not yet. It, we can repeat back the question after you ask it. If you turn it on, it works. Oh, better. there you go. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the the Internet of Things is going to be obviously disruptive to major sectors of the economy, but it's also going to create all kinds of innovation opportunities in the the connection of people. We saw Google and Amazon and LinkedIn be created. Is, are Google and Amazon and LinkedIn going to be the, the winners in this phase, or are we going to see other entities that, that develop like that to connect in the, the, the thing side? I think they certainly could be winners, and there are many other companies who might enter and innovate in new ways. But definitely some of the same kinds of capabilities that we saw play out in the consumer space will be important. Uh, and will create real value in the industrial space as well. So uh, imagine, you know, if you think about Street View, right, one of the, 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 you can go look at the Eiffel Tower and walk around it. Imagine using the same thing to actually look at your supplier's factory floor uh, to, to help troubleshoot an issue. Um, imagine uh, imagine uh, uh, sourcing ideas for, uh, uh, just, just as we now go to WebMD to figure out how do I think about and interpret the symptoms that I have, imagine uh, being able to uh, uh, kind of source globally ideas for a yield problem that you're having uh, by being able to identify or characterize the, the system that you're living with. So I think, uh, I think a lot of different companies are starting to, or already getting into this space of providing uh, uh, new services, and I think we'll see a lot more uh, come in, and I don't know how that competition will play out, but we will see a whole new economy around uh, the manufacturing and industrial app space and other related services. But it's exactly along the lines of looking at the Google and Apple model, because what the race right now is to develop platforms. Now, we are developing our own, uh, other people are as well. The issue is the race to develop the platform that can then capture the largest share of the market. Anybody, anybody else? I think we're at the end of our panel time. Um, why don't we just do a lightning round and see what people might have left off? Do you want to start with you, Michael? Well, just the point about the platform, I think yeah. by its very nature, 
this is, it, it is a winner-take-all market, so it will tend towards a monopoly and, and probably take on the form, depending on the, the jurisdiction internationally, of, of a regulated public utility of some kind. Although we're very much in the early wild, wild west phase, and as I said, you, know, you don't want premature regulation. I would just say, think where we were 25 years ago and whether we could have predicted which companies would be strong today. What we need to do is preserve an environment in which things can bubble up from lots of different places within the United States and to put out the kinds of resources and infrastructure that will allow these new ideas to be there. I'm not counting on today's winners being still the ones that we see in 25 years. I hope you're wrong on that, but <laughs> <laughs> I would just add that we focused a lot on the digital in this discussion, but the digital is also powerful because it's accelerating other changes which are more in the physical nature of doing things. So think of advanced manufacturing, new techniques like 3D printing, new processes, new materials. So it's really also the digital as accelerator of a more tangible innovation. Um, I would say two things. First, um, we've talked about this as something that's coming in the future, but actually it's here now. Um, so as you said, uh, the cost of sensors have dropped 90% in the last couple of years. The number of machines connected is, has uh, uh, increased uh, three times at the rate of the past. So this is already happening and creating value. This is not, will it happen and you know, or should we place bets on it? This is already transforming the way companies work, GE included, but others. And the other thing I think is exciting is that this really does change, if you look at the global picture, um, this and other trends are changing us away from a win-lose, zero-sum game to a win-win opportunity. We're going to see a lot of innovation and investment in manufacturing in China, but we can also see a lot of innovation and investment in the U.S. It is not an either or, it is a both. So I, I, I thought this was a great panel. I want to thank you all. I think this is exactly the kind of conversation and topic that New America has always been so fabulous at, at nurturing. It's not an issue that uh, necessarily the right or the left is going to make big hay uh, attacking the other one for. It's really an issue that's about the future of the country mm -hmm. and the citizens of the country. And so thank you all for contributing such thoughtful things. And I think, you know, I hope New America will carry on this, uh, this work and keep in dialogue with all of you. And thank you to New America, but thank you mostly to the panels. Thank, thank you very much.